Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Yes. Me, uh, Good morning. We're, we're very international today, huh? <laughs> Good morning. So while we're waiting uh, for the Sunday Friday risers to join, I'm just going to give you a uh, high level overview of what my mission for today was. And um, before I, my seven, some input into what your opinion is, because today's topic is seven ways to add value to your clients. And it implies or it speaks out to going beyond the transaction, okay? And thinking about um, the lifetime value of a relationship, the lifetime value of a client. And, you know, we're all very guilty. Um, I'm raising both my hands of investing in marketing to find new people. Um, but I think our biggest asset is, you know, our uh, database or I don't even like using the term database, but our, our clients are uh, trusted, our trusted network that can really give us the business that is worth having. And uh, I see Robert is, uh, are you back from Maine or are you, you're sitting in the Maine, Robert Barber? Got, got back last night. Uh, came back a couple of days earlier than we had expected. But when I saw what the topic was today, I had to make sure that I had good internet access to be part of it. I'm glad you could come. So, Robert, you know, getting a lead from, you know, a, a Remax agent across the country, getting an internet lead, having a call in on your sign, compare the quality of those leads to past clients and, or I don't want to use the term past from, from your network and your many who are uh, formerly done business with us, what's the, the difference in getting a lead from somebody who worked with us or knows somebody who worked with us versus, you know, a paid lead? So Rob, it's, uh, it's really very, uh, very easy to answer this question because there's no better lead than a lead that comes from someone you've done business with previously. A while back, uh, when the managers were teaching classes over uh, Zoom calls, I did one on just this category. And uh, my story was that I have a client who uh, I started with right as I got into real estate 17 years ago. And in the ensuing 17 years, I've done 14 transactions related to them with a volume of close to $16 million. And it's because uh, they liked me right off and started referring friends, family, and themselves who happened to be in a position to purchase several homes. So, I mean, that, that you know, the saying is, was like shooting fish in a barrel. You know, it was establishing the relationship before I was even a realtor. I was establishing a relationship with these people. And, and then when I got my license and I called them up, they were like, oh, terrific, because here's what we want to do. And uh, it just started there. And it continues to, you know, just uh, this past year when I sold a house for them that went for $2 million. Um, so it's the way to go. Deal with your clients who you've dealt with previously is the easiest of any of those other lead generation processes. Fantastic. And I'm going to put, does anybody know Gary Vaynerchuk? Anybody know the name? Raise your hand. Sure. Uh, I'm going to put, let me see if I, I'm going to put in the chat a link to something I'd like you to watch later. I'm going to ask Fred or whoever's doing our editing to put this um, with the recording, this little link. We've got an awesome lineup. Um, it's our first episode of 2021, and we are going to focus on one question, as you know. What does the modern media plan look like in 2021? Next up, John Rulin is the leading authority in maximizing customer loyalty through radical generosity. He is the founder and author of Giftology, a system of using generosity to build relationships with new clients and generate thousands of referrals through empathy and kindness. He works hand in hand with organizations from UBS 
to the Chicago Cubs. Welcome, John. Hey, Gary, how are you? Good, John. My best friend, Brandon Warnick, he's going to be thrilled when he rewatches this because he is a big Cubs fan. So thanks for helping out there. John, uh, actually, I think, you know, unlike most of the brands that have been on here, give us the one minute spiel on exactly what you do because I think that will help people. And then what I'd like to think about is the framework of gifting and what the media platforms are that give it some power to be able to do some stuff. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I grew up in Ohio. I'm a farm boy, uh, goat milk and farm kid from Ohio. And uh, I thought I was going to go be a doctor to get out of Dodge. I grew up in a town of 400 people, but uh, I had a mentor uh, early on when I was 20 who was radically generous and built these amazing relationships and was kind of a referral machine. And I realized that uh, he, you know, in any business, it's all about relationships, whether you're one person or a you know 10,000 person company, everything rises and falls on employee and client relationships. And so I realized nobody was teaching people how to be generous and to do it strategically. Most people would, you know, here's an Amazon gift card, here's a bottle of wine, here's a whatever. And so I dropped out of med school and started an agency. And uh, about five years ago, I wrote a book called Giftology. We're the only one in the space. Everybody else sends stuff, uh, but we're teaching people how to use gratitude and generosity and empathy really as a year round thoughtful thing to do, not just to check the box at the Christmas time. Uh, like a lot Go of people figure. Do. Go figure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the channels, you know, yeah. like what should brands or startups or, um, you know, entrepreneurs here be thinking about? What should they know about which media outlets give them a better chance to execute the thesis? Yeah, well, I, I think that uh, our we're, we're getting a lot of inbound of people reaching out wanting to engage. You're talking about influencer marketing and different things and. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, they do things very generic and very vanilla, whether they're launching a book and sending out, you know, 500 copies in vanilla envelopes or whether they're, you know, uh, trying to get on podcasts or whatever else. And so I think that the focus for us has been going into, and I, I heard somebody else mention this earlier on, it's human to human, it's one to one. And I think that a lot of people have done too much stuff that's to the masses and I think that, you know, 2020 with the pandemic, I think people have realized that, hey, these are human beings that you're dealing with. And I think that a lot of people haven't realized until now, until everybody's at home and kids are running in and dogs and whatever else that like, oh my gosh, they're a human being outside of whatever channel they're in. So I, I'm seeing a lot more people reaching out wanting to, uh, you know, like the, the traditional ways of building relationships, whether that's with mass media or whether that's at conferences or dinners, like the traditional ways have been blown up. And so people are, are struggling. How do I build connections from afar? I think a lot of people took for granted, like I'm, I'm going to be able to go to CES or the Super Bowl or whatever else. All of those the building relationship or engaging people is completely gone. And so uh, we're seeing a lot more people that are doubling down on how can I take you know my top 2% or my top 1%. And similar to what you did with, I think you're talking about Taylor Swift. She can't show up at every wedding but she can show up at one wedding and you did it with the Jersey. Uh, you know, a guy spends $300 on wine or champagne yep. or whatever. And you show up with a Jersey that becomes a ripple effect. That's that, you know, people are, it's, it's a story worth talking about, whether it's on Snapchat or Instagram and you're seeing brands that are getting wise to leverage and say, Hey, I can't, may not be able to do it for everybody, but let's pick 10 people and go all in on those people. I mean, and you know, this, I mean, after Crush It, which looks smarter and smarter these days, the next book I wanted to write was The Thank You Economy. I wrote that in 2010, you know? I mean, I believe in this, it's in my religion. I don't even understand how people, I can't believe that pe people are, oh, 2021, like we should do, how this is progressive thinking in 2021 makes me want to rip my eyeballs out and jump out this window. Me too. I, I mean, I've been talking about it for 20 years in a different vein than you have on social media. It's more like, you know, if, if a relationship matters, how you show up for them in the valley, especially in a pandemic, is the time to double down on generosity. It's the time to show up and be extra bold with people. How, John, and, do, you, do you agree that, I apologize, do you agree a lot of people fuck this up because they want the tactic for their business and so because their intent is grounded in that, it kind of smear, like, I think the reason this is such a challenging concept is that you have to have this incredible 
kind of like separation of the short term and the long term. I think what works for me, John, is I do all this kind of stuff all day long because I think in 67 year terms and when people try to replicate it and I watch them or when clients fuck up the stuff that I want them to do, it's because they care about the 67 minutes or days, not the 67 years. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I tell people all the time, the long game is decades, not days. And if you do do something nice for somebody and then ask for the referral or ask for the, the opening door or do whatever, that's not a gift. That's a manipulation. That's a bait and switch. Correct. And so people, people can tell. I tell people all the time, like, if you have the wrong energy when you're doing something for somebody, then even reading between the lines, you can tell when somebody does something or they do almost go too far. And then when it, it, like you can tell that you're being bribed, that like there's a difference between being thoughtful and Gary, bribed. Gary, I'm gonna do you a huge favor. I'm gonna pick you up at the airport and take you to your hotel, but it, that's grounded in, hey, I need to pitch you my business, bro. So like, you know, they're, they're like, I'm gonna help you buy the jets if you give me a million dollars to start this company. P, you know, I, and then the biggest one, John, I don't know if this has ever crossed, how this crosses over in your world, this gets into a very deep feeling I have around people who say, I always get walked all over. And I talk to a lot of these people and I say, are you getting walked all over? Or were you giving as a manipulation tack? Because giving is giving on the other person's terms, not on yours. And I see a lot of people crying, Gary, I don't like being nice. I'm always walked all over. And I, I'm a weird guy. I go deep with them. you know, And I yeah. do this 20, 50 times a year. And 99% of the time, they weren't being sweet. They were trying to manipulate a situation by giving somebody something they didn't want because they wanted something in return. Thoughts? Yeah, well, I like the book Give and Take. Uh, there's giving, taking, matching. Most people are matchers that want to, they want to be a giver but they're playing in the matching world of like tit for tat. I do this for you, then now you have to do this for me. And I think you've talked about it, like your jab, 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 right hook was, you give, 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 then you earn the right to maybe ask, but it doesn't, right. it does not give you the, like, like if you keep score and get pissed off, and I tell Bill all the time, like I'll do things that like, we sent somebody a sauna as a gift. I didn't ask for anything and it didn't pay off for literally years later. But it wasn't because I asked for anything. He was inspired. And I think there's a difference between, and I think that's where most people in get with gifting, they're not really doing gifts. What they're doing is they're, it's a carrot and stick. It's a incentive. Correct. It's a reward. Correct. And when, whether it's for your spouse or whether it's for your biggest client or whether it's for an influencer, when you do things with the right intention it, and no strings attached and then show up again and then show up again and then show up again, you start building the social bank accounts like with your spouse. If you show up with a gift and then ask for something five minutes later, it wasn't a gift. You were trying to get something. It was a people. ticket. It was a cost was of a entry. John, yeah. it's exactly right. John, I swear to God you're talking. You know what fires me up? I do a ton of this shit. I'm more excited when it doesn't pay out. It makes for I'm, a better story. It but, makes for a way. But you know this because, you know, I don't even tell. I just love it because it speaks to the merit of the truth of the intent. Well, if it worked every single time, then it wouldn't really be like we're emotional beings and what people don't understand. And that's why agencies or big companies sometimes have a hard time with like playing the long game of you're going to love on all these relationships and then not ask for anything. And they're like, well, what's the date on that? And I'm like, well, it could pay off this way or it could pay off 10 years from now. Are you, are you, you say you're playing the long game, but are you really willing to make deposits year, year after year, quarter after quarter in your employees, clients, suppliers? And the answer is most of them, they, they, they want to say that they're playing the game in decades, but really they're, they're playing it in quarters because they're a publicly traded company. And they're like, I got, if I do, if I go take my marketing budget and I slice off $5 million and go invest in all these people and it doesn't work, then my head rolls and I'm, I'm out of a job. And so most people are positioning themselves to play the safe thing and leveraging generosity with all these relationships is a weird concept and it's a freaky one, but it, but if everybody was really good at thoughtful it's, gift giving, the, it wouldn't work, it would just be it's, noise. It's the least weird, the least, you know, this is the most human, be a fucking good person, funny shit happens. Go figure. I, I don't know. All right, brother, thanks for being on, continued success. Hey, thanks for having me. What this talks to is the motivation behind, um, what we do. Okay. And uh, seven ways to add value to clients. Anybody ever get a gift that you feel is more like a manipulation or a marketing ploy for you to be promoting somebody as opposed to it being a genuine thank you? You know, uh, you know I can relate to you, Adona. I want to share with you a gift that comes from me as opposed to uh, no offense to the Buffini. I still think we need to do it, but 
you know, dropping off a, um, a reminder of us and our business on a pop by. Does anybody think that there's a, there's the motivation matters? Everybody's quiet. Absolutely. So the intentions. Right. So you, you don't want to. Presence is important. One hundred percent. You don't want to feel like, hey, you know, Fozzie, I just gave you a gift because I'm hoping that, you know, you'll give me a referral. Um, somehow that's cheapened, right? Yes, because the intentions are um, with deceit or for further gain. It's not even, it's not even deceit, but it, it's more like um, tit for tat, right? Like Correct. I'm giving this to you and I want you to give me a gift back. And mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about the uh, Gary Vaynerchuk interviews. Look up his name because I only have one screen here today. I have a technology issue. So Gary Vaynerchuk interviews John uh, Rulin, R-U-H, L-I-N, who wrote a book called Giftology. And um, you know, he talks about some of the things that, you know, that we talk about, but he really puts it together, the system. And the system is not, uh, he, he calls it uh, ROR, ROR. Does anybody ever hear of the term ROR? I think everybody knows ROA or ROI, right? What's ROI, anybody? Released on their own recognizance. What's that? <laughs> Released on their own recognizance. <laughs> Based on that's no, that's not R O R O I, but that's a good try. Return on return on investment. Return on investment. Return on investment is the uh, R O I, and somebody had the R O R nailed. Return on relationship. Yes, congr congratulations, you got it. And Mr. Durso, since uh, released on recognizance, we have to have another discussion about you. <laughs> Um, so return on relationship, right? And the return on relationship is based upon putting the relationship before the outcome. And, you know, I know, uh, or I'd like you to, to trust me in all my years that if you're doing something for a manipulated purpose, you know, people in the Northeast and, and people in, uh, in Florida, because you have a lot of us Northeasterners down there will, will sense it and it will be muted. This gentleman who, uh, John Rulin, who wrote this book, of all things, you know, don't exit the mastermind when I tell you, but he's from a farm in Ohio and he wanted to be a medical doctor. That was his way of getting out of milking cows and getting up early in the morning and doing all the things that you need to do. If it's not your labor of love, it's probably pretty dramatic to have that obligation. So while he was in college, he actually got affiliated with a company that many of us probably know, and we hit the decline button when they call, called Cutco. And um, he claims to be the most successful Cutco person out of over 2 million sales reps throughout the system. And his philosophy was, you know, if I'm going to give you a Cutco knife, for example, I'm going to mute everybody here. And, and I've seen these pitches a lot of times. I'm going to give you this Cutco knife as a thank you for buying a house from me. Does that make sense? And I think, was it Barbara, you're the one who said return our relationship, right? Yes. So when do we normally uh, give a gift um, in a transaction? Closing. We give it at the closing, right? And that is probably the biggest tit for tat out there. And uh, John talks about not having it be the expected gift, okay? And he talks about uh, avoiding the ABCs, anniversaries, birthdays, and Christmas because people have an expectation of something. He's like, you know, four months, six months later, do a personal stop by with a handwritten note and, you know, give your gift at that point. And um, he claims that he was the most successful Cutco salesperson ever because his philosophy was different. He would coach his um, clients to, um, rather than say, you know, compliments of um, Rob Durso, Remax Select, he would put on there, you know, uh, for the family of um, Rob and Sigrid Lazar. And he wouldn't even promote himself on there because it said it has more meaning. And he wouldn't give it when they expect it because if it's expected, it's minimized. And I was like, you know what, there's something to that, you know? And, um, you know, I just want to think outside the box. And he talked about, you know, corporate sponsorships and people wanting to um, hop on the bandwagon and use some of his systems. 
and he says that normally working with corporation doesn't work because he requires a handwritten note. And he said, you know, if everybody just did one handwritten note a day to the people that are in your relationship, the people that are in your network, okay, that's the ROR, okay, instead of ROI. Because I'm, I'm a, I've studied um, accounting and finance, so that's how my brain is programmed. And I'd like to, to make a calculation and say, if I invest $1,000, I'll get 1150 back. That's a 15% return. But the return on relationship is priceless, okay? And um, to Robert Garver's point, you know, I think he said um, he did $16 million worth of business with one particular client that he invested in the relationship. Um, I don't know, you know, if he made or provided gifts to that person, but sometimes um, providing a gift for doing a transaction, if it's expected, is is not as valuable. Sometimes we, we're programmed that if there was a, a mistake with a vendor, right, only when there's a mistake will they send you a gift to kind of apologize. So the way that gifting is interpreted is either expected or apologizing and not random and not investing in your relationship with your network. And I think I'm going to use the word network from now on to re replace past clients because clients should never be passed unless they've unfortunately passed away. And, um, you know, uh, we should treat people in our uh, sphere, our network, as if they were future clients, okay? And not give them a gift because you expect them to give you a transaction, say, you know, I gave Rob Durso uh, $1,000 in gifts this year and he didn't give me any transactions. I'm going to scratch him off the list and try to give my gifts to Nancy Klein. Maybe she'll give me some business. You know, that's the, the wrong methodology behind it. And the magnitude of the gift is less significant than the thought that was put into the gift, if that makes any sense. Is it resonating with anybody? Because I don't have a whole lot of, of feedback here. And um, I, I really want to get you know, some feedback from you on, you know, on this, the topic, the subject matter for today. I'll, so. I'll jump in if you, if you want some feedback. I, I think that any good business is based on this, whether we realize it's ROR or, or something else in our minds. Uh, if we've been in business for any length of time, uh, this is part of it. Uh, one way or another. It's all about so, the relationship. So I'm um, glad that you uh, you chimed in here because uh, your former uh, association invested a lot of money in billboards, right? Yep. And they can be rather expensive, correct? Very. What what kind of what do you think the most you've paid for a prime billboard is? Oh gosh. Um, I'm, putting this, I'm putting you on the spot. There was one that was. Uh, was about uh, ten thousand a month. So ten thousand a month. Now, now let me. Now, now, hopefully, your former employer is not listening. Okay. Hopefully, are you with me here? Yeah, I'm here. But, but Rob Durso, what would happen if you took that ten thousand and you invested it in relationships instead of marketing, and whether it was two hundred dollars um, times fifty? You, you took a $200 gift, you did a handwritten note, and you went to 50 people in your um, network, your relationships, and you gave them a handwritten note with a very well thought out gift and uh, not a gift card, but you gave them a gift that was well thought out. Do you think you might have more business at the end of uh, 12 months than you would from paying just one month of the billboard? Oodles. It would it wouldn't be comparable. Now, does anybody anybody uh, if you've done a billboard? I'm I'm guessing that a lot of the the psychology behind that is they call it maybe brand building because you really can't in many cases you know relate somebody saying hey I was driving down Route One or the Turnpike I saw your billboard I called you I want to list my house this weekend rarely happens right almost never almost never. So, so the um, the ways that you can add value 
is investing in the relationships instead of um, building, you know, hollow, shallow relationships that probably people don't even want to be in. You know, if you know somebody calls on Zillow and they don't buy that particular house, you know, in most cases, you know, they're like, leave me alone unless you're highly skilled and you can build that relationship off of a transaction, right? Because how often are they, who, who does um, well on Zillow? Anybody on the, uh, I hope somebody on the call is, uh, or the meeting is doing well in Zillow, anybody? So uh, I see Eric probably can't talk. Uh, Ron, do you have students that do well on Zillow? Ron Piccolo? No, I don't. Uh, I don't have any of my agents that uh, use Zillow. I mean, buy leads. You mean you're talking about that? Yeah. <clears throat> None of my agents do. Well, let, let me ask you: when when somebody reaches out on I Zillow, I did at one time. When somebody reaches out on Zillow, are they um, inquiring about like a specific potential transaction, or are they looking to build a relationship? In your opinion? No, they're just calling for information on a property. Right. So they're calling about a transactional piece and um, the the value and the longevity in Zillow is the skill to create a transactional call into a relational call, if that makes any sense. Right? Rob, yeah, uh, you, you, can form, you can form a relationship with uh, a client. It just depends how you come across. We, we try to. We try to get them to be loyal and work with us, but sometimes they go the right field. So Good. Robert, you had something to say? Um, well, Angie um, commented on the chat that uh, she's doing okay with Zillow. She can close up to six deals a year with her current plan. Okay. And and, and I am, I know Angie, as do you, Robert, and, uh, you know, she, like everybody else, randomly or, or, or rarely sells the property that they're inquiring about and is a uh, skillful um is this is a skillful professional at building relationships okay um, we have lisa on here too rob that's uh incredible at the zillow conversion relationship thank you yes i did okay with zillow and um yeah, and I tried to convert them into relationships, and I managed to do that with quite a few. Yeah, Lisa, you're very modest. You did okay. You you crush it with the the Zillow. Um, but I, I think that you probably don't focus on selling them the house that they inquired about. You see them as being a future relationship for you, um, not even for one transaction, but hopefully they're going to be lifelong clients that refer friends and family, right? Exactly, yes. Or, 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 or wrong, if I'm wrong. No, no, that's exactly what I'm aiming for, to build a lifelong relationship and uh, eventually get referrals from them and repeat business. Great. Um, Just taking a, a note to share at the show notes here. Um, so is there anything that anyone wants to volunteer that you do with your sphere or your clients that that isn't a, um, a, a tit for tat or um, putting them as a marketing point of ours, you know, giving them a shirt to walk around town um sponsoring the little league i think is a marketing um uh marketing investment more so than a relationship investment rob i had i had clients who were relocating from texas to uh, mountain lakes and they had um three children um and they were moving in just before the beginning of the school year and I thought, what could I do to help these children feel comfortable in school? And I realized the thing to do was I called friends of mine who had children the same, the same ages as these three children. And I arranged for them to meet before, like a week before school started, um, so that on the first day of school, you know, my relocation kids had somebody to walk to school with and new friends right off the bat. 
and um, they became lifetime friends, these children, um, so much so that the, when the family had to move away again for relocation, uh, and the parents said to them, okay, where do you want to go for vacation this year? We can go anywhere you want. They said, we want to go back to Mountain Lakes and see our friends. So that was that was something that um, you know was very moving for me to uh, to see that, and the parents uh, were thrilled. So so, um, and and I think you know Robert, you did it for um, uh, genuine motivations, right? Um, and it wasn't. You know, you weren't contrived thinking out, hey, if I introduce this client to the friend so they walk to school together, I'll get more referrals. It, it's just not that linear. And, and I don't think it can be, right? No, no. And, you know, whatever happened, you know, afterwards just happened because of the relationship that uh, I established with the people. Because it did turn into one where they sent me referrals from all over the country. But it certainly was not um, in my mind when I made the calls to find children to meet with these children. I think, Robert, it was done from the heart. And that's the difference. Right. Um, who, who on this call can honestly say that they would turn down a... $7,000 piece of business from somebody who they just get a bad vibe from or don't feel like they um, trust or respect. Is there anybody that would turn down a $7,000 commission? Okay, I have Robert Barber would. Uh, Linda, you'd turn it down, right? Yes. Okay. Um, Lisa, you would turn it down. How about a $30,000 commission? I want the same people that would turn it down. Uh, Robert, would you turn down a $30,000 commission? Well, that certainly makes it for a different question, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, ideally I would like to say to you that, you know, if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. No commission is worth your license. You know, if you think that, uh, you know, these people are gonna take you down a path that you don't want to go down, you know you shouldn't go down, then yeah, I would say no. Same for me. I wouldn't take uh, a client that I feel is not trustworthy or um, there's something shady about them or they're not very nice and uh, don't treat me with the res respect that I give them. So uh, I think that's important to have, um, you know, some kind of a standard. Amelia, not not all money is good money. Uh, I agree with you on that. Um, let me let me give you a an example. Um, you know, and this example might not be the precise example that I'm I'm striving for. But if, if you meet with somebody who has different values than you, so Mickey, uh, you meet with a two million dollar listing in the area. You've been trying to grow your business, and you're like, this will be great. I'll get calls. People see I did business, and the homeowner says, you know what? Um, we just uh, painted the basement because it, it, it always leaks. We want to list it now before hurricane season so that we don't have any fresh water coming in there. And we refuse to do a seller's disclosure. So, Mickey. That's a, that's a shady one. Um, so, I don't so what know. Do you, what, do you, what do you do? That's a tough one. I probably would encourage um, the, the seller to put a sump pump in, which is not very costly, uh, do some kind of remediation. Um, and not just try to sell without, um, you know, without disclose. And, and, and you don't have to put a, a disclosure. I get that, that when people don't want to list everything uh, because they may not know all the details of, um, you know, the right. issues that could arise. But in that case, I would just, honestly, I would try to, to talk the client into uh, fixing that first before selling. Uh, if you go along with that, I think you'd be in violation so you you know because you are he's told you about that you know about it yeah but if you fix it, it but if you but if you're fixing it oh, and you're putting a sump it. pump in then it's, it's not it's not an issue he's right. saying what if they don't want to do that from historical oh. 
perspective, you have to mention that there had been a water issue. And yeah, and that's why you're putting in a, a, a sump pump and you're resolving the problem. Right. So, so uh, we could probably do a, a whole hour on this. And Mickey, I appreciate you um, being a uh, uh, into it for a conversation here. And uh, I, I respect your answer of not doing it. And I know that it, it's difficult. Uh, but if somebody wants us to do something that, um, let's even say it wasn't violating the, um, the code of conduct or the law, but it violated our integrity, um, I think there's no price that you can pay to, um, like you can't be half honest, you can't be half this, you can't be half that, right? And that's what comes to define us. And, um, you know, I would say, you know, Mickey, your your um, assessment of, you know, guiding him or walking away is is admirable and it's the way that has to go. And I think a lot of people in the industry, you know, probably might say, well, hey, you know, if you don't tell me, I don't know, we'll go without it. Do you think do you think that there's some people in the real estate industry that would go ahead and do that, um, either Mickey or um, or Rob? Oh, absolutely. Uh there's a lot of people that would just hide it and not uh, not disclose and don't want to know. So, so there is honestly a lot of dishonesty out there for the buck, you know. I mean, you know, it's some people just have no scruples and they'll just some of these agents will just do it just to make the money. They don't care, but then they're in violation. They're gonna they, they're gonna get nabbed if they don't get nabbed on that deal. Then they get nabbed on maybe ten deals down the road. So, so, so uh, Ron, I know of a, of a case where um, there was a significant disclosure um, issue and um, an agent, and it wasn't one of our agents, so I just want to be clear, I just uh, found out about this. The agent um, asked the seller's attorney, you know, um, I know the house flooded, they say they, they fixed it, do I need to disclose that, right? And the uh, the seller's attorney says, no, you don't need to disclose that because it was fixed. Okay, I'm, now I've now, never heard of that before. Okay, so I, I I think the attorney is absolutely wrong, right? Yeah, I mean, um, that's... and the attorney doesn't have the uh, the scruples which some attorneys don't, and the attorney you know is not a licensed professional with our obligation, but an agent believed the attorney okay and the agent was like you know what i'm going to be a diligent agent i'm going to ask in, in email i'm going to email the attorney and say you know um, do we need to disclose this because i want to do what's right by my client the attorney says no um i'm glad everybody's saying this is absolutely wrong but let me tell you how the case plays out okay um as part of the real estate community, we're held to a higher standard than even an attorney. And I've been, because the attorneys write the laws, um, take that as you will. But if there is a claim for damage, um, there is a, uh, a component of constructive or consumer fraud. And uh, somebody said they lost a major lawsuit that way. That's correct. And um, our duty is even higher than the attorney's. Um, the client, the agent did not disclose it. Um, there was no water problem. Um, there comes a hundred year storm and the property floods. And, um, when it, when it floods, you know, they get it repaired. One of the neighbors says, oh, you know, the Joneses before they bought it, um, there was a big flood and, uh, you know, it's a shame that this happened again. Well, their attorney got hold of it, sued. Um, the case was almost going to the point of being dismissed until something called discovery happens. Does anybody know what discovery is? What's discovery, uh, Mr. Discovery, Dershow? Discovery <laughs> is when something that's been hidden is discovered. So, uh, so, it's knowledge. So it's knowledge. Uh, it's if you have knowledge of something. Fact finding. 
Right. So the agent says that they didn't know about it. The uh, attorney involved in it turns over all the emails from the transaction and it shows that the agent asked about that. And uh, he responded that, no, you don't need to disclose it. Agents like, see, I told you I was right. But then the court says, well, you now had knowledge of it. You had a an absolute um, uh, non-negotiable duty to disclose that because you had knowledge. You can't rely upon an attorney um, the governor or the president to say you don't need to disclose it. That's a duty that we have. So um, they actually wound up um, paying all the legal fees and buying the person a brand new house. And that's a true story. And um, I tell you that not because I want to scare anybody, but I'm, I, I tell you that because sometimes when something doesn't feel right, um, we either need to do what Mickey does and see how they respond or um, we need to attach our reputation to um, uh, more honorable characters, if that makes sense. And um, wow. you know, if, yeah. if it's a if it's a five million if it's a five million dollar house, that means that your your integrity can be bought. And I don't want to have the conversation here, but I just think that that doesn't really make any difference. And uh, I think that our integrity shouldn't be uh, come with a price tag, although I suspect and, you know, Robert, you've been in the business a long time. A lot of people would be tempted by um, the transaction to compromise their integrity and not do what Mickey did, which is, you know, um, require uh, or force somebody to do the right thing before conducting business. And, and hey, this is, go ahead. Eric here. You know, I think you need to synopsis, do a little synopsis on that and email out to every agent out there. And then I'd personally like to put it in my portfolio. And then when a seller asks me to do something questionable, pull that and show it to them. I always, I do the opposite of what you're doing. I always bring it down to a hundred dollars. You know, I ask, what would I do in this situation if it was only a hundred dollars, not $30,000? Because I've been in that situation where it's $30,000. To, to just, you know, have a little gray area. And then I said, well, but then I said, if it's $100, what would I do? <laughs> Absolutely not. So that's that's how I base my decisions on what would I do for 100 bucks, not for 30,000. And, and uh, I think that that's a, a communication style, Eric, that really highlights the fact that, you know, you're kind of putting a dollar value on your integrity, right? Because right. everybody for $100 would disclose it, right? But what yes. you're saying, what you're saying to your client, you know, I assume mostly sellers, is for thirty thousand dollars, you're willing to be a, a deceitful, dishonest, or maybe even criminal. Yeah, that's true. Right. I mean, if you think about it that way, and I do know, uh, and I know this firsthand when I was doing due diligence on acquiring an office in Florida, that um, somebody actually went to prison um, for. Uh, disclosure. And I didn't even think that that was humanly possible. But um, when I was uh, looking at their E&O claims, somebody had uh, uh, sold the property and um, th there were sinkholes identified in this particular part of the state. They were aware that they were subject to sinkholes. There was a report issued on it and they didn't tell the agent. Um, the buyer bought the property and lo and behold, guess what happened? Sinkholes occurred. And I believe they had to tear the property down. And while they were tearing the property down and taking the, the um, washing machine out, they found behind the washing machine, a copy of a report that was issued telling them that they had this issue and the person served prison time. OK, I never would think that that would happen, but I saw that firsthand from a uh, an e &O claim that actually the agent had no knowledge of and the person went to prison for because that's a it was a uh, major safety and health issue and it arose to a different statute in Florida. But anyway, you can't be bought. I love your example, Eric. Um, you it's know, my blatant disclosure. You know, and, and Colleen, there's a lot of codes and there's a lot of um, rules and laws, but basically, you know, for the most part, people are either honest or not honest, right? Absolutely. And when you become dishonest over 30,000, 
Um, as an agent, you're willing to turn a blind eye to make a $30,000 commission or allow a seller to do a $30,000 omission. You know, what normally happens is that, that if you get away with it for 30,000, then you might say, well, it's only a hundred dollars. We don't need to disclose that. That's the, that's the mindset that happens, but I don't know how we got here. your integrity. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure. Rob, it, it yeah. was about building relationships, right? And, and and at what point will you cross over the Rubicon to do something that's shady in effort to get a paycheck, right? That's how we right. got it. Okay, so the reality, I had a friend of mine who had taught me that engaging in any relationship with anybody, I have to ask myself this simple question. At what cost to my peace of mind and my serenity Am I going to be taking on this relationship? Because regardless of whether I'm selling or buying a house with them, it's a relationship nonetheless, right? And so when people are asking me to do bad things, I have to say, yeah, no, I got to go talk to St. Peter at the end of my lifetime. And he's not going to let me in because I screwed this old lady by not telling her something. And that's really, so at what cost was the question he would ask me? when I was engaging in a relationship and I'd have to evaluate, is it going to cost me peace of mind? Is it going to cost me serenity? And is it worth it for me to lose those things? So, what are so those? what's the value of those things? So, so I want to say something to you, Jay, because I really appreciate that assessment, but, um, and, and if anybody's ever um, taken a transaction where you had a bad feeling about somebody, whether it's not, um, that they're looking to do something that's dishonest or unethical, but you had a bad feeling about the client that you're working with and have uh, lived to regret it. Okay, I think most of us in this business have, have probably learned that lesson where, you know, you meet with a seller, you meet with a buyer, um, they treat you with disrespect and they, they look at you as um, just a money grubbing uh, agent looking for a commission. Best advice I can give you, even if you're desperate to, to get commission to pay your bills, is to turn that client away because it rarely ever works out. It never feels good. And for crying out loud, you don't want referrals from that person, right? Because they, they associate with people like themselves. I don't know how the universe disseminates this, but that's what happens. I think if you live by the rule to do unto others as you would have others do unto you, it's easy to make that decision in every scenario, whether it's how you treat your clients or even the uh, the way that they treat you. I, um, I think I get a lot of referrals from my clients, but I go out of my way and I do everything possible for them. And uh, nine out of 10, I've had multiple referrals. But at the same time, if I've dealt with somebody that's just rude and disrespectful, I've walked away. I've walked away from a from a listing in my in the beginning of my career. That was, um, you know, uh, that one, Rob, that the million dollar uh, one that I listed and it was overpriced. And the guy and the son was really rude to me. And, uh, you know, it just wasn't worth it uh, to to be treated like that. And that's not uh, people that I want to associate with or help. So, um Living by that simple rule, I think, is an easy way. Well, it, it, it costs you in the long run. Uh, if, you, if you associate yourself, if you take on that client, that you just feel the connection is not good and you're going to have a problem with them in the future, you are definitely going to have a problem with them. It costs you in peace of mind and it also costs you business. Because when you're dealing with someone like that, they bring you, they bring you down, they, they wear you out, you wonder why you ever chose to be a realtor, and you're not out there getting more business and working towards improving your, your career, because it, it just costs way too much. It's not even a matter of, of money, it's a matter of your emotional well-being. I mean, and, and, and if you if you get abused in a transaction and disrespected and you get a commission at the end, 
I would say that that's not that's not um, healthy for a long term career in this business because, you know, um, I was I forget who I was talking to, but we we were discussing that um, if you're watching the clock in this business, it's a horrible. Well, I know who it was. It was uh, Sanjeev uh, said if if you watch the clock in this business, it's the worst job ever because if you love what you do, time just flies by. And I was discussing that because he used to be a chef and that was another passion of his. And he's like, Rob, I probably worked 12, 14 hours a day, but I loved what I did. So for me, it was okay. It's just a matter of like, I had other things I needed to do in my life. And um, if you don't enjoy this business or if you get abused in this business, no matter how much money you're getting paid, you will not last or you will not manage to be a healthy state of mind as you move forward in the business. Rob, Rob. Rob. Rebecca yes. McDonald's been trying to say something for a while now. Hey, Rob. How are you doing today? I'm you know, doing great. How are you, sir? Great. So sorry, I couldn't answer before. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm listening here. It seems like everyone has their own moral compass. And, um, you know, obviously, we all want to be as honest as possible uh, and still make a living. Um, but it, something came up recently, and I would love to get what you think about this one or anybody. Um, do you think it's necessary to disclose a sober house in an area? Um, disclose what? A sober house, which is like a halfway house only. They're going into larger, bigger areas, and they're, um, they're buying the house and putting in like the eight to 10 recovering um, drug addicts who are now a protected class on the, on the federal law. And um, it seems that they're going to neighborhoods. And um, so if I'm busy showing a house in a neighborhood, is that something that I need to disclose? Or is that something that I should not disclose because they're a protected class? What's your thoughts on that one? Um, wow, you put me on the spot, Eric. I used to love you, man. <laughs> I know. Well, listen, um, you like to handle the hard ones, but, uh, you know, we have, what, 50, 60 people in here. I'm not sure who has an answer to this. Maybe they know better than I do. So it's a million dollar, uh, right, a million dollar neighborhood. And, and I and I really had, I'm struggling trying to show that house, you know, something trying to show houses in that area. So my, my instinct, um, and, and uh, I'm going to, maybe lean into some of our other brokers on the call, but I would probably uh, have to look into this. And sometimes um, I believe the law is intentionally um, vague on some of these issues. And you can talk to three attorneys, you'll get three different answers. Um, but I, th I think this would be one where you might have to say, look, you know, as a buyer, you know, you need to do your homework on the neighborhood and, um, you, know, you might want to check wherever you might find that and tell them to do that as opposed to saying that there's a, um, you, you called it a silver house, um, Eric? Yes, S-O-B-E-R, sober, oh, sober house. Sober, I thought you said silver, sober house. Sober. Um, uh, yeah, Rob, we have them around here too. They just started popping up just so you know, the government's financing um, the the these homes. Um, I think we... <laughs> like 200,000 that we need. Depends on the project, but th that's happening around here too. Now, that, should, that, that happened to a friend of mine in Englewood. Uh, uh, she didn't know, had no idea that that came into her neighborhood. And actually I, I advised her to just call a lawyer and see what, uh, you know, uh, uh, precautions she can take or what they can do. Because I've never heard of that. That seems so wrong to me that they're able to do that in a neighborhood, in a nice neighborhood. So, and Rob, there's, that, there's... That, so that falls under a fair housing act uh -huh. because it's an American, it's an American disability act. So it falls under as um, no different than mental health. So That's it falls under Yeah, but you have, you, have, uh, you have alcoholics and you have junkies moving into your neighborhood. That's, that's a little severe. Well, that's the weird thing. This is something that came up literally this week. We got told by somebody and they all got blown away by it. So it's in Chester. Uh, apparently it's the third one that they've opened up in the local area, but it's literally in the middle of neighborhood where the homes are sold for like 1.3. Um, and of course they're all up in arms. The school has already started redirecting the school bus. 
But, you know, the question is, you know, how do you deal with that? I, you know, if you're going to list the property, if you've got a buyer looking at those properties, you know, what so, do you, you have know, to disclose or what can so, you, can you disclose? So, so can I, can I, I want to, um, I want to talk about um, the Megan's Law in New Jersey because I'm very familiar with it and I want to uh, let everybody understand why it is and then I'm going to get clarification on this so that we don't play guesswork if there is a clear direction. And um, the uh, motivation is I understand it for Megan's Law, which is a law which says that um, a uh, homeowner is entitled to find out if there is a convicted sex predator in their neighborhood only after they buy the house. Um, does anybody know why that law was written that way? Um, this goes to the mindset of why things might not be the way we anticipate them. Anybody? Yes. Uh, why is that? Rob, this yes. is Tony. Hey, Tony. Um, it's because it's because they um, already did their time, apparently. So they are not discriminated against again. But basically, I think... Um, I think this should be handled exactly the same way as it is with Megan's law, which means that um, it's up to buyer beware. You can tell the buyer that they're going to have to do their due diligence in that area before they move in. It's not something that you can really bring up, but you might tell them that it's up to them to do to, you know, just they need to check out the area. Um, so, 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 Tony, that's what I thought. But can, can yeah. I tell you? Am what I wrong? I'm, well, um, what I've been told why the law is the way it is, is not because we don't want to discriminate against the person, but let's just say that you have a, a million three house and your next door neighbor gets convicted of a sex crime. Is that going to impair your value of your house? Yes. So if we allowed, if, if we made a law because we wanted to have full disclosure and we say, um, if somebody, if a homeowner is aware that there's a, a sexual, a convicted sexual predator in their neighborhood, they have to disclose that. They may never be able to sell their house, right? So therefore, the neighbor's crime has impaired my value, right? Right. So what they're saying is they're trying to balance um, the burden of who has the impaired value of the home. So they, they don't want a conviction. I mean, that, that can be, no, if we, I get if, it. If, if we had this, let, let me just finish. Doug. If we had to disclose that, that might take three or $400,000 away from the value of that house. Would you not agree? Absolutely agree. Because nobody wants to live next to a sexual predator. Right. So why, why should this innocent homeowner, because his neighbor got convicted, um, lose $400,000 worth of value? So the way that the New Jersey court has ruled it is we're not allowed and the uh, local enforcement is not allowed to even notify somebody if there's a sexual predator in the neighborhood until after they've closed on the house. Right. As, as sick I'm as not saying sounds, I agreed with it. I'm just saying that's how the law always read. I mean, I, from what well, I understood well, that we weren't allowed to, the homeowner could. The I, think a, I think there's a website you can go to. So, right. so, so, so Tony, the, yeah. the, the, the issue goes towards who's <clears throat> harmed by it. And, and the court balanced and said that we, we don't want, you know, Ron Piccolo, who is an <laughs> he's a stand up citizen, takes care of his house to lose four hundred thousand dollars in value because a monster next door is a sexual predator. So mm -hmm. they don't even want him to disclose that because that would impair his value. But the buyer, okay, is allowed to know that once they close so that they can take whatever protective action is necessary. That's the way that the, the yeah. balance was struck in New Jersey. I, I don't know that I agree, but I, I understand right. it. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. The biggest um, problem I see with this, that it's not just for one. Oh, hold on. Am I on? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the uh, the dilemma that I have with this law, uh, with this law, or with this scenario, even in my uh, friend's uh, situation, it's not one person; it's like a halfway house. They have they're busing people in and out of this house. 
um, that are coming from the city and from you know other uh, areas. And it's a beautiful, nice neighborhood. And now all of a sudden, um, there's junkies. Um, and maybe they're not junkies now, but they certainly look like junkies. Or uh, I guess they're being treated for, for such. And it, it's like not only does it uh, decrease their value, but but their safety, I feel, is, is threatened. So it's almost kind of like, how could they even do that? where they put these uh, halfway houses or whatever they're called in neighborhoods, where, residential neighborhoods with little children running around. All right, so I, get... would come in handy All right, so I, 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 I want to I wrap up the subject at hand. I think we always go into some great directions here, um, but uh, the seven, the, um, the, let me just be clear. The um, lifetime value of a client, I know Robert said, you remember Jared James at R4, Robert? When he talked well, about um, the lifetime value of a client? Yeah, I wasn't at that R4. Okay, and he's had a couple of, uh, you know, conversations and he's done some research. Um, this is the best known research that I'm aware of about the lifetime value of a client. And I wanna say it was about four years ago before the housing values have exploded, right? And he determined um, through a scientific uh, method uh, that the lifetime value of a client based upon the average career of a realtor and the average sales price and how many transactions the client does was $117,000. And, you know, I think a lot of people were like, there's no way I'm not making $117,000 off of this client. But I've heard so many stories of agents saying that, you know, this person, you know, uh, was the hardest transaction, they didn't make much money, but they referred me this person, that person referred me. And, you know, they know exactly how much revenue that that tree has generated. And many of you on this call may also, like Robert, know how much money was generated. You know, that 18 million, could be worth up to $480,000 in commission, Robert. I hope you appreciate that client. I genuinely do, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, the one of the things I left out of that story is the fact that after several years of working with these people, um, they asked me to be the godfather to their daughter. So, I yep. mean, that just is more the relationship than my ability to negotiate a good deal. Yeah, you know, um, you know, whether you got 2% or 4% on a transaction, you know, 10 years from now, you'll never remember. You know, whether you got three, three and three quarters or three and seven eighths as a mortgage rate as a lender, your client's not going to remember that. They're going to remember the way that you treated them, and you're going to remember how that transaction went, not you know how much money you made off of each and each particular client. Like we don't look at a client appreciation day at everybody and mentally you know we give them a name tag and then we put underneath the name tag how much money you made off of them. Would that be obnoxious? But if you thought about it that way and you looked at everybody based upon the uh, money that they contributed towards your career, it's just as bad, okay? Um, but Jared James has said before the housing um, uh, run up that the lifetime value of a client is 117,000. I would say, let's take care of our clients and treat them as the asset that they are, the ROR, uh, the uh, return on relationship. And the um, the seven ways to add value to your clients, and this is according Bring to me. Bringing in the uh, chairs because it starts to drizzle. All right, hold on, Mickey. I got to. Um, the seven ways to add value um, to your clients is give without an expectation in return. Okay, and I think that goes. Um, that that's looking at it instead of a financial transaction as a relationship uh, investment. Um, think relationship, not transaction, um, and have random acts of kindness, not expected um, tit for tat. You close, I give everybody that closes a two hundred dollar gift or whatever it is. That makes it transactional and uh, a little bit less personal. 
intention matters. Okay, and I'm going to leave you with this, that if there's somebody that was um, not a good person, not respectful, didn't appreciate what we did, um, I would say don't give them a gift. Like, you know, focus on the people that are um, like us that are going to have the same mindset that we have. Um, number four is don't just put the credit card out, personalize it. Okay. And maybe, you know, is there anyone doing more than, well, I don't want to ask this question, but if, you, if you're doing 17 transactions, like the average agent in Remax, you can write a handwritten note for every closing. And you can include that with whatever gift you have and talk about their relationship and the way that you appreciate them. And there's a number of things that you can appreciate about every client. Um, be grateful, okay? Um, you might say, how does that monetize? I don't know how the hell it monetizes, but I do know that it matters. If you appreciate and you're grateful, it, it it's the universe coming back to you in a way that you can't calculate um, on a spreadsheet and uh, spreadsheet person. Um, part of, you know, um, making this investment in relationships is also being vulnerable because all relationships, you know, because you're kind to somebody, somebody might not be kind to us in return. And it's okay to be vulnerable. And it's okay if you, know, you might say, boy, I didn't, you know, that person didn't even say thank you. Well, that's an expectation. Okay, it's okay to be vulnerable. And then avoid the ABC, which is anniversaries, birthdays, and Christmas, and um, be consistently unpredictable. And that may sound like it's a contradiction, but you know, don't on the on the house anniversary or you know, don't do it at the same time every time. Um, I think the gesture has more meaning when it's unexpected and personalized. Okay. So I hope that, you know, this is, you know, nestling in a part of your mindset. And if you don't take action immediately based upon what it is, maybe it causes us to think just a little bit differently. Okay. And, um, you know, we got into a lot of questions about, you know, ethics, which kind of piggybacked off of, you know, working with people who we respect and like. And if we work with people that we like, um, either they won't put us in that position or they will like us in return and they will listen to our advice, Mickey, and they will do the right thing. Because that client that asks you to maybe, you know, not disclose something, right? And you're getting them, you're advising them how to, you know, solve the problem appropriately. There's a good chance, and I mean, there's a good chance that that's going to come back and bite them in the butt, right? And, and, you know, they might even say, oh, Mickey, maybe I got an extra 10 grand, but now it cost me 150,000 in legal fees. And I got to put a whole new, like, you know, water filter, water uh, remediation system in. I mean, that may not happen on that particular client, but over time, I can guarantee you that it will happen to somebody. Okay. And why would you want to play that roulette with your client? Okay. So, um, you know, these are really obvious, but I'm going to uh, end the call uh, before I take some questions by saying, you know, Eric had mentioned, you know, $100 and how some people might not challenge their integrity over $100, but for a $30,000 um, problem, they might want us to look the other way, right? And we all agree that the $30,000 non-disclosure is a problem. The hundred dollar non-disclosure is not usually a problem because the person will fix it for a hundred dollars so that they don't have to disclose it. But here's where I want us all to think about the integrity and our ethics. Um, not being honest with the homeowner and telling them what they want to hear to buy a listing or um, trying to take a listing where you don't have um, where you don't have competent knowledge. I think it's just as bad, okay? We've seen people in the industry, we probably all have um, maybe been influenced to lead a seller to believe their house is worth more than it is. Um, 
but that is a violation of the code of ethics to mislead them on um you know what we know is or what we believe to be the reality and um you know that's kind of like that hundred dollar versus the thirty thousand dollar thing it's maybe uh, a little bit of a white lie to get the business in but if you put the customer's needs ahead of yours, you'll have abundant business. And if you say, look, and I wanna be completely honest with you, this is, you know, putting it on, um, trying to get the highest mark price. If it doesn't work, we're gonna lower the price. And if we lower the price, what's gonna happen? Like that needs to be automatic. That needs to be a belief system. And we need to not have to think about those type of questions in my opinion. So, I'm I'm done. I hope this was uh, inf informative and maybe you know lays in your subconscious and when you do some things. Real quick, Rob. <clears throat> Excuse me, Frank. So adding on to that, with the experience that I just had in losing the listing, was as you hover each one of these very important topics, have them sign it, have them initial, and recognize that you're documenting that you review these very important topics and then send them a copy in an email. And it shows your professionalism in being detailed and, and getting things completely done accurately. It'll just impress your clients even more that you're that on top of things. Plus, it also creates the accountability. Right, I mean, and, and um, you know, they say um, do things as if nobody's watching. You know, I think some people talk about, you know, that paradigm, but I think, in this environment, you know, virtually everything is discoverable because of the way that we communicate. Um, 10 years ago, um, a lot more was done over the phone, right? Now, don't we tend to text with our clients more than we do talk to them? Yes. And does that not leave a, um, that leaves a trail of any missteps that we might take, whether it's with good or bad intentions? Rob? Yes. About uh, three years ago, I lost a listing because they disclosed that they had a roof that had issues and um, they had problems with their water heater. And I said, well, these are things that you're going to have to address and the reasons why. And they said, well, nobody will know. I said, well, there's a seller's disclosure that comes with a listing. They wanted me to complete the seller's disclosure and they demanded it and they wouldn't do the seller's disclosure. You know, I had to just walk away from the listing. So Rebecca, can I, can I um, chime in on that? And I, I wanna do it from the spirit of contribution and um, maybe looking at another way to address it. Would that be fine? Yes. So I, I would say, you know, um, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, uh, even if I was willing to overlook and not put, not um, disclose this, 97% um, of home buyers are going to do a home inspection. And any home inspector that uh, is competent is going to identify that there's a. Now, if they find out that there's a problem that you knew about that you didn't disclose, do you think they're more or less likely to cancel the transaction, Rebecca? Not necessarily so, but when I had spoken to them, I actually did that. No, 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 but, but, but I mean, and I'm not saying it works all the time, but I'm, I'm asking not you, not your seller, but I'm saying if somebody I finds out it, about it, something it. that that the seller, you know, knew, right? Let's say it's obvious that they repaired it and uh, that it's at the end of its life and they don't want to disclose a problem, right? Yes. When the home inspector finds it, the buyer is going to think that, the seller is less than forthright and honest and might be looking for a lot more. Would you agree with that? I agree. And would you agree if the house went under contract twice and comes back on the market that the third buyer is gonna discount it because they might think that there's something hidden and wrong with it? Yes. So if we decide to work together, Rebecca, you know, I think it's in your best interest to make sure that we disclose this and maybe even give an estimate what it costs to repair so that the inspector doesn't find it and that ultimately you can get the highest price because people want to pay up for somebody that's honest and if they still say i don't want to disclose it then you know that that's a piece of business i walk away from 
but I think I would have a different strategy of how I have that conversation. And Rebecca, it's not going to work all the time, but I think we need to know what that strategy and what that conversation looks like, right? Yeah. So, so I, I'm in no way being critical. I think you probably made a great decision walking away from it. But another way to engage in the future is, you know, to get the homeowner to self-discover what that might do to their own interest, right? Because a lot of problems, a lot of problems are discoverable by a home inspection. And, you know, if, you know, uh, you know we have a firsthand case where a uh, seller duped us, they filled out a disclosure. They said there were no problems with the, their septic system. And um, the local septic company comes out when the new homeowner is um, having a problem with their septic. And when they come out to the house, the guy's like, oh, well, can you do an inspection? They're like, no, we were here six months ago. We told the owner that these are all the problems that need to be done. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? So the, the person that, that failed to disclose, okay, had a report fills out a seller's disclosure saying everything is good. This was not our seller. We, we were working with the buyer, okay? And the buyer um, says, in this case, I have that disclosure that there's no major issues. I'm going to make my offer not conditional upon a home inspection because that's what needed to be done then. And we wind up in this mess. So, you know, integrity matters. Um, the seller of that property is paying a hell of a lot more now than he ever would have paid if he would have been honest and disclosed it, okay? And if, if I'm an agent on the street, I would be sharing that. I would not share the names, but I would share that story and what, what's possible to happen if you're not honest and forthright. And not to the fact that I'm favoring a, a buyer over a potential seller, but I've got your back covered, Rebecca. Any seller that works with me, I want to make sure that I give you the best possible advice that's in your interest. So anyway, I, I uh, Rebecca, I appreciate that. And Greg, I appreciate your commentary. Um, you know, you probably do a whole uh, hour on, you know, what we could have done differently on that one, which I, I'm not quite so sure how you do it. But you know, this is a great topic, Rob. This is a great huh? topic for a mastermind. This is a great topic to do again for a mastermind, the disclosures. So, um, I just wanted to share that I have a property um, that is in an estate and the person that represents the estate, they don't know too much about the property, but, but they did know a little bit, but they weren't willing to fill out a seller's disclosure. I said, that's fine. I said, you know, they opted out and, you know, I have them sign off on it, but me, I have a duty to the public to disclose what they said, right? So you think about it, right? They had a termite treatment. There's baits around the house. They don't want to disclose anything, but you uh, as a professional have an obligation to the public in general to disclose anything that is visually apparent to you. That's all I just wanted to share. Yep. And, and you know, we all have um, you know, done CE credits and we've uh, taken the course to get licensed. But let's be honest, most of the stuff that we're talking about is integrity and common sense, okay? And um, I took my broker's test. What I did is I studied two sets of questions beforehand and I was like, all right, if I don't pass, I don't pass. But I just applied common sense, okay? And common sense is 90% of what we do, okay? The question that I, I wasn't sure about is, you know, what's the fine if you break this rule, okay? Because I wasn't studying how much the fine's going to be because I'm like, all right, I know I'm not going to break that rule. Um, and those are probably the questions I got wrong, uh, but I did pass on the first time and I would credit that to common sense. And most of the laws that we have with the exception of the, the um, sober house or the, the Megan's law are, are good common sense. OK, and you don't need to have um, a law to explain doing the right thing is the right way to go most of the time, or if not all the time. And, and the Megan's Law one 
is unique in that you can't penalize the owner. So it puts us in a really precarious spot. But, you know, virtually every other time, you know, your instinct to do the right thing and to tell people to be transparent works out both ends. Okay. So um, I, I, like hope, I hope this is Robert Good. Yeah. Um, I just got off the phone with Mary Kano. Uh, I asked her about the issue with the sober houses. And she said that it would be her, her understanding that we could not, uh, we should not be mentioning that. Um, she's checking with uh, Jeff Dollinger uh, to get, uh, you know, his uh, feeling about that. But she said that it's it, it's her understanding that it's not something that can be brought up. And we, we, we might get into trouble by thinking we're advocating for our client. Exactly. Because of our, because of our statutory um, requirements, and I, I, I suspected, and I think you probably suspected the same answer, right? Yeah. And Mary Kano is a very, very knowledgeable person, but you know, even her, she wants to be double and triple sure. And you know, Jeff might give one answer, and Barry Goodman might give another. Is that possible? It's possible, it's but it's not probable. probable. But yeah, <laughs> but it's possible, right? And it yeah, might have yeah. different opinions. So um, anyway, uh, I think this this topic went beyond giftology and and loving on your um, your uh, network and your clients um, into a whole nother area about how we attract the clients that deserve to be around us. So um, I, I hope that you know over time that these little um, uh, conversations just stick somewhere in your head and uh, influence the way that you do business. All right. Have a wonderful weekend. I know I'm going door knocking with some folks. Uh, tomorrow I'll be uh, doing some in Florida. I'll get some dates out and, uh, and next week as well. And for those of, I forgot to welcome our new Remax of Princeton office. If there's anybody on here, uh, welcome to our family here. Um, we're excited to have you on. That was my first Remax office from nearly 30 years ago, and they're back in the family. So welcome back, Remax of Princeton. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Thank you Rob. Bye. Thank you, Rob. Good weekend. Bye.